Cool. Thanks very much, Elka. So when I've spoken about this work, which is mainly based on my PhD student Anton Puzichov's project, I've used a variety of cool uh, sort of catchy titles like how I learned to do cyanobacterial synthetic biology and sing the blues or something old, something new, something assembled or something blue or roses are red and cyanobacteria are blue. And this all links to the blue phycobilly proteins that we work with on that project. I've been slightly more conservative with the title of this talk. I'm calling it using the Cyanogate platform to engineer Synecosystis 683 for production of thermostable mycocyanin. So just a bit of background about myself. Again, uh, as Ilka mentioned, I'm at the University of Edinburgh. I established my lab in 2013, and we are at the King's Building campus, which is in the south of Edinburgh. You can see this is the Rutherford Building. My lab is over there. And nearby to us, we have various interesting and cool facilities like the Synthetic Biology Center and the Waddington Building over here, and a new building, which you can't see on Google Maps, which is the Waddington Tube, which contains a whole bunch of new plant science facilities for growing plants and, and algae and things like that, which we're taking advantage of. So my lab primarily focuses on improving photosynthesis in plants uh, using microalgal CO2 concentrating mechanisms. I've been doing that for several years. And something else we've been doing is trying to utilize cyanobacteria as bioplatforms for producing high value products. So you're probably all familiar with this, but uh, cyanobacteria are very promising as bioproduction platforms, but they do suffer from, from several shortcomings, particularly low yields, uh, slow growth rates, and I suppose still relatively a, a lack of molecular tools for manipulation compared to your more established E. coli or yeast platforms. This is a, a graph I've taken from Paul Eric Jensen's review a few years back. And it's basically just indicating how many of the electrons that are used in photosynthesis can be redirected in cyanobacteria towards high value products. So you can see over here, we've got a few winners like sucrose and butanol diol in terms of how much is used. But for our more high value products over here, only a very small percentage of electrons are really channeled towards this process. This is something we need to really get working better, I suppose, in cyanobacteria. And, and I suppose more recent studies have made some progress on this already. So one thing we can do besides trying to develop tools is look at the a huge diversity of cyanobacteria out there. Cyanobacteria are highly diverse in terms of their morphology and their metabolic capacity. They have a massive amount of secondary metabolism that we're only scratching the surface of. We've only really described about half, only 43% of the species available or in nature. So that we predicted about six, six and a half thousand cyanobacterial species out there. We've only really named half of them, let alone worked on them in any particular way. One of the things I suppose we're interested in doing in our lab is trying to identify species with desirable features and a question we can ask ourselves, well, what are the desirable features for culturing and genetically engineering a cyanobacteria or even algae strain? So one of the first things you need to do if you want to have a genetically tractable strain is it needs to be able to grow on an egg or plate and you need to be able to isolate colonies, as you can see over here. The cyano has to be sensitive to antibiotics, so you can select use selection processes following DNA uptake. And of course, they need to be amenable to DNA uptake using either natural transformation or transconjugation or electroporation approaches. They need to have the capacity for genomic integration by allelic exchanges like homologous recombination. And ideally, they'd be amenable to the generation of unmarked mutants. So you can use counter selection modules like Stack B or CODE to remove the antibiotic selection set and make an unmarked strain. And then last but not least, the ability to use broad host range self-replicating vectors like the RSF 1010 based vectors that are available is good because it allows you to do more heterologous gene expression. It's quite useful for applications in CRISPR-I and gene circuit development. And that's something we've been playing with for the last while. So this is a slightly dated slide, but really what it's showing you is the real prolific increase in molecular tools for cyanobacteria that have become available over the last few years. So really just highlighting about 35 new molecular tools that have been published over the past seven years, and there are a few new ones missing. And these relate to a whole variety of things from RNAi tools to new CRISPR-I or CRISPR activation systems, new standards for cloning and cyanobacteria and part libraries, gene circuits that are developed, new inducible promoters, and genome scale models. And then, of course, as I mentioned earlier, these new more robust and faster growing chassis that have become available, these new Synecococcus strains. And I'll mention one of them briefly in the next few slides. So I'll talk now about one of the things that we developed a few years back now called Cyanogate. And this is mainly what we developed for the standards and cloning and, and a path library for the cyanobacterial community. And how it works is basically like, like Lego in that you can build your gene expression cassettes together. So you have a, a suite of level zero parts, which have promoters, 
your gene of interest, your terminators and things like that. You then assemble those level zero parts in one pot to make a level one vector for your gene expression cassette. You then can take several of your gene expression cassettes and put them into what we've called a level T system. And that level T system will either be a, a vector which can be integrated, allows integration into the chromosome of your cyanobacteria of interest, or it can be a self-replicating vector, as I said, an RSF1010 based backbone, for example, that can self-replicate like vectors do in E. coli, for example. So just to go into slightly more detail of how we put that system together, it's based on the, the syntax of the plant Moclo system published in 2015 or 2014. And I suppose what we wanted to do was, we, because we work with plants as well as cyanobacteria, we wanted to have one system where we could move between them. So we really hijacked the system in some ways. And that if you look at the plant Moclo system, you can see they have, you know, for example, if you want to build a level one cassette, you have your level zero promoter of 5 prime UTR, a signal peptide, your gene of interest, and a, a terminator sequence over there. So these have a specific syntaxes associated with them when you build them together. And so what we did is we used those syntaxes to build systems that are amenable to what most cyanobacterial researchers do. So for example, here, if you're going to do a homologous recombination event to knock out a gene, you want to have an upflank and a downflank region. Then want your markers like SACB or an antibiotic selection set. And then you can use that for marking cyanobacterium. And then again, you can change that SACB and antibiotic resistance set for an unmarking linker to then counter select using SACB. So just to say again, once you've got your level one expression cassette, you can go to level T. And from there, you've got other self-replicating vectors, these uh, different kinds of resistance. The one we published had a canamycin and I think an ampicillin resistance cassette in it, but we've now made some spectanomycin ones as well. Engineering them isn't too bad, but you can uh, get, get in touch if you're interested in having a spectanomycin version. So again, for self-replication or a direct integration into the chromosome. Your level T self-replicating vectors can work both with electroporation or transconjugation methods. Most of you may be familiar, but just in case you aren't, electroporation works by mixing your cyanobacteria and your extracted level T plasmids together in a, a specialized tube over here. And then you electroporate it and basically you plate those out. It's usually pretty high efficiency, but not everyone has this, this kind of equipment available. Slightly easier potentially is transconjugation, where you take your plasmid, which is actually still in your E. coli donor strain, there's your level T vector sitting inside there, and then you have a, an E. coli helper or transcon a conjugative strain, which uh, facilitates the uptake of that plasmid into your cyanobacteria of interest, to put it simply. And the thanks from Conrad Monahue's lab and Eric Paul Eric Jansen's lab, got a few of these helper conjugative strains and found them to work in a, a civil cyanobacteria now. Yeah, using the Cyanogen system, we've tested how it works in Synecocystis 6 uh, and a more fast-growing, high-tolerant strain called Synecococcus UTX2973. We've tried it in several other things, but this is what we published in our, our Cyanogen paper. As you can see, uh, I've sort of highlighted over here, we, we tested the expression strengths of several promoters and uh, between UTX and Synecocystis to see how they compared. We had a look at a CRISPR-I system uh, using DCAS9 to see how, how well DCAS9 could knock down a YFP, which is stably expressed in, in Synecocystis. Uh, we've also uh, updated our Cyanogate system for DDCAS12 now, actually, as well. So uh, that seems to be up and running nicely. And then one of the more recent things that my PhD student, Grant Gale, published is a, basically a, a nice system for analyzing the terminator efficiency of various terminators. And this is something we don't actually do that much in cyanobacteria, is look at terminator efficiencies. And so he basically looked at the library that we had published previously in Cyanogate and used the system. It's like a dual expression system to look at the efficiency of how well terminators terminate. Uh, you can see you've got a, a range of terminator efficiencies over here. I wanted to highlight this one specific terminator called TL3S2P21. Uh, Not to say that it had a, an extremely high level of efficiency. It was one of our, our most efficient terminators. But interestingly, what we found was that when we expressed it in our system, it actually produced very high levels of YFP. And so this is quite unexpected because it was much higher than, than any of the other terminators. And so we've tested this now and uh, we're rebuilding it in, in other plasmids. And we found that when we've used this terminator, it actually tends to produce high levels of at least YFP, which is what we've tested so far, which gives us some interesting evidence that possibly terminators might also be involved in, this, in the capacity to translate gene expression into uh, gene products and things like that. So yeah, feel free to have a go with this if you want with whatever transgene you're interested in. I'd be interested to see how well it works with other genes as well. So one of the nice things about the, the Cyanogate system, because it's based on MoClo, it lends itself to automated DNA assembly approaches, particularly those used by DNA foundries. And fortunately, we have a genome foundry here in Edinburgh called the Edinburgh Genome Foundry. And the Genome Foundry, if you can use MoClo assembly, they basically would use all these lovely robots, you can see in the top right over here, to do assembly of your constructs, so level zero all the way through to level T. 
their process you can assemble incubate transform plate pick colonies eco like colonies extract electroporate and then sequence those colonies so you can see the numbers that they can do with these robots per day you get 3000 assemblies plating you know 200 samples per hour and the picking rates also particularly high they don't often run at that pace but it does give you show you the potential of the system for generating plasmids and one of the things we're trying to do at the moment working with them is to see if we can do this with cyanobacterial transformation as well and we've, we've had some interesting uh, or promising results actually this brings me to cyanosource which is a mutant library for Seneca cystis that we've are working with the edinburgh genome foundry and the bio foundry in norwich which is a collaborative project with David Lee Smith, who's at the University of East Anglia, who's collaborating with the, the BioFoundry in Olam, and we, of course, with the Edinburgh Genome Foundry. So the idea here is we want to generate a, a knockout library of every single gene in Seneca so it's about 3,500 genes in total, and we want to do this in a standardized way, so we're developing all the plasmids and the foundries, we're trying to do the transformation of the foundries as well. Uh, it'll be a standardized design for mutants, and the nice thing about the mutants as well is that they'll have barcodes in them, so if you wanted to do pooled experiments, you could pull your potential mutants together and grow them, and then you can use next generation sequencing to look at the abundance of particular mutants in your pooled culture. They will also have the capacity to be unmarked, and so then you can replace that protein of interest once you've got a, a stable segregated line with something else, for example, an immuno or fluorescently labeled version of that protein if you want to track its movement, or you can modify the protein by changing a particular amino acid and examining how that affects its function. There's also the potential, because you can unmark the system, to go iteratively generating multi-gene mutants uh, using the the available vectors we've had used for each of the mutants that we've generated. So if anyone who's listening is interested in a particular mutant that they want generated using this approach, please let me know. We can put that on the priority list and uh, get back to you. Having talked about tools now for a bit, I just wanted to go on to a more applied part of the story, and this is going to be talking about Anton Puzichov's work on Ficobili proteins. So most of you should know the cyanobacteria naturally produce high quantities of pigments, and in particular, they produce high quantities of these phycobili proteins, which are protein pigments that exist on this crown-like structure. They are basically linked to the photosystems. As you can see, there's thylakoid membranes. You can see these dots along the thylakoid membranes. Those are the phycobili proteins. And what they do is they are blue pigment proteins that act to harvest additional light and give a cyanobacteria a bit of an edge in terms of light harvesting efficiency. They consist, at least in Seneca cystis, to have an alpha-cyanin core over here, which is light blue in color. And you have a variety of linker proteins, the CPC2, CPC1, and CPCG1 and 2, which then link these rods of phycocyanin to that alpha-cyanin core. You can see there are six of them on, on, on Seneca cystis 603. And each of these is a, a phycobili protein complex. About phycocyanin, it's, it's mainly produced from spirulina. It's a wide number of industrial applications particularly in the food industry because it's a natural blue pigment it's, it's quite sought after as a replacement for these synthetic pigments actually classed in the same category as diesel uh, so <laughs> in terms of being dangerous so i think their use in the industry is, is something that's being moved across to more natural pigments it's kind of a high demand thing at the moment phycocyanin is also used in pharmaceutical industry in the cosmetic industry as therapeutics uh, very well uh, used in nutraceuticals and you can actually use them as fluorescent probes for research purposes as well so one of the downsides to Phycocyanin uh, from spirulina, spirulina being a mesophilic species which grows at you know, sort of normal uh, ambient temperatures, is that the phycocyanin, because it's a billy protein, it, it naturally degrades under, under stressful conditions. It's got a pretty narrow pH range, usually between about four and seven, where it, um, it, it stays blue, and only stays blue as well below uh, temperatures of about 45 degrees. So if you exceed these range ranges, the, the protein complex starts to denature and your villains can no longer produce that blue pigment and obviously your, your blueness disappears. So you do find a phycocyanin in, in thermophilic cyanobacterial species as well and, and these phycocyanins are actually better. Uh, they, they operate at a better pH range and they have a much higher thermotolerance. But of course growing thermophilic species is quite challenging and the yields they produce are relatively low compared to things like spirulina. So Anton decided to try to use Seneca Sisters as a bioplatform for producing thermotolerant phycocyanin. For those of you not familiar with the phycocyanin operon, it's, it's one of the most, I suppose, popularly, uh, commonly talked about uh, operons in cyanobacterial research. It's uh, an operon that consists of CBCB and CBCA, which encode for phycocyanin subunits, and then your linker proteins in Seneca Sisters 683, C2 and C1, and then this cap linker CD. And then in your thermotolerant species, you have a very similar kind of operon setup in Thermosynococcus elongatus. The operon consists of CPCB, CPCA, a single linker, and the DCAP as well. And if you look at these structures, you can see that they're very, very similar, although the Thermosynococcus structure is slightly more tightly wound together, which is, I think, one of the things that we think allows it to have a higher thermotolerance. 
briefly speaking, what Anton did, and this paper was published relatively recently in Metabolic Engineering Communications, is he used the self-replicating RSF10 10 vectors from our Cyanogate kit to introduce the Thermosynococcus opron, uh, we call this uh, the TEPC, and uh, various truncations of that, into a mutant of Seneca cystis uh, 6 3 that lacks phycocyanin. So basically the entire Seneca cystis opron would be knocked out, and we call this the olive mutant because it looks quite sickly green like an olive and not blue-green like a cyanobacteria. So we found that when we complemented this olive mutant with these various forms of the uh, TEPC, they turned uh, back into a, a similar to a wild type color. And we had this lovely fluorescence forming as well, which is again indicative of the fact that the phycocyanin is being villainated and uh, it is functional. So one of the interesting things we found about the study, and I'm not going to talk about this in detail here, is that the, uh, the complemented strains actually grew better than the olive mutant. And we also found using various fluorescent approaches, like 77K uh, fluorescent analysis, that the structures that were formed in our uh, complemented lines were able to channel light, uh, we expect, to the photosystems to enhance growth rates. So basically, these non-native phycocyanin proteins were capable of working with the native machinery to capture light. And then the most interesting thing, I suppose, from a biotechnology application is that when you extracted this phycocyanin from these complemented lines, is that they were very thermotolerant. So this is a heat treatment we did over here. At, I think this particular one over here was at 60 or 70 degrees for five minutes. And then if you spin down your cultures for our wild types and consistent strain, you can see the whole thing denatures and becomes a gloop at the bottom over there and the test tube is clear. Whereas the phycocyanin from our complemented lines or from our uh, basically the thermosynococcus line stays nice and blue over here. So we, we did a variety of additional tests on this at different temperatures and different pH ranges. And you can see at pH ranges of between seven and three over here at the top that our TEPC is much more stable at these different pHs, so 40 degrees, whereas our liner blue, which is commercially available of phycocyanin, uh, denatures at lower pHs, pH four and three. You see it starts going down over here over time. And then when you put the whole system at 70 degrees, we found that basically the line of blue completely collapses after 15 minutes, whereas our thermotolerant phycocyanin, at least at the more median pH ranges, retained its stability and also slightly lower, but as you go towards the lower pH, it tended to break down a bit more. So this is, this is quite exciting and showed that we could actually produce a more thermotolerant phycocyanin in a mesophilic species. And we wanted to test then afterwards whether we could actually do this at scale. So we applied for a bit of funding from LG UK and the IBIRC. And we applied for a project where we could take one of the better strains that we produced, the TBCAD, I believe, or BACD. And we decided we were going to grow this at a scale, a pilot scale, which was 120 liters. And we decided to build a nice little photobioreactor setup over here. <laughs> this photobioreactor setup probably cost about a few hundred pounds, whereas our CO2 mixer over here cost about 10,000 pounds. Basically, what we wanted to do in our work packages here was to culture the cyanobacteria and see whether it could express TPC over a long culturing time at scale using our self-replicating vector. And then we wanted to test how to harvest and extract TEPC from Seneca cystis, which is something that's not typically published in terms of Seneca cystis. Phycocyan extraction and purification studies are mainly based on spirulina. So first thing we did is we uh, put our system together and then we decided to test what the impact would be of growing cultures in the absence or presence of canamycin. So canamycin selects for our self-replicating vector. And we wanted to see was if we took canamycin out, which is obviously something you wouldn't want to have when you're doing this at scale, uh, whether there was any impact on the culture performance. So the first thing we did is we tracked growth over time and you can see the culture density increasing over a period of about 20 days over here. As you can see, the cultures got greener. They didn't grow particularly fast. Our photobioreactor system was, wasn't the best setup overall. We just got a bunch of very this is wide carboys with a light uh, system at the back over there. What we were quite excited to see, it's not something you typically see in the labs when you grow things, because obviously you usually do 50 moles. It was nice to see 120 liters of culture growing. So that was uh, on day, on the early days and we have day six. And then by day 19, we got this really nice, more dense culture forming over here with almost like just exopolysaccharide a matrix just forming over the top over here. So all the cultures seemed to be growing very well. It didn't seem to be making a difference whether we had canamycin present or absent, whether there was any difference in culture growth. And then when we had a look at the phycocyanin content, we actually found that there was, well, I suppose slightly more phycocyanin in our cultures that didn't contain canamycin compared to those that did. So we, we think this is probably due to biological variation uh, and that they probably had very similar amounts of phycocyanin. But what this really indicates is that not having the antibiotic wasn't non-beneficial to the system. The self-replicating vector wasn't getting selected out due to the absence of canamycin. It was actually hanging around and producing appreciable levels of phycocyanin. And this is actually consistent with the pub, a paper that was published recently, I think, in Metabolic Engineering, which had a look at Seneca cystis's capacity to hold on to the RSF1010 vector. And it could do this for, I think, I think they took the study up to about four weeks. So I think for, for culturing systems, this is quite, quite
quite an interesting thing to think about. Most people want to stably express genes on the, on the chromosome when they want to think about biotechnology or applications of cyanobacteria. But potentially the self-replicating vector could still be used and also potentially selected out, which might be good for, for safety reasons later. We tried a variety of other uh, culturing approaches to see if we can improve our growth rates. We tried using higher levels of light and two times BG11 to provide a bit more nutrient sustenance to the, the cultures. We tried a higher white light and higher red light, actually incrementally increasing red light. And uh, what we found is that increased white light, but not red light, resulted in faster growth. We think this is probably due to the fact that the red light's capacity to penetrate those big carboys wasn't as good as the white light. Uh, red light tends to be more efficiently absorbed by water and chlorophyll. So, I think our estimates was there's only getting about 10 centimeters in, depending on our, our culture density. So the, the red light, as you can see over here, cultures only grew about as fast as our initial experiment with the canamycin and no canamycin cultures at, at lower light intensity. So once we had grown our cultures up, we wanted to try and harvest them. And usually in the lab, when you've got a nice little 50 more plus, you can spin that down in the, uh, in the centrifuge and with 120 liters, that's a bit more tricky. And if you're thinking about doing this at scale, you do need to think about alternatives to centrifugation. So we turned to a chitosan based flocculation approach. And so what we did here is we used chitosan, which is a, a linear polysaccharide composed uh, of leukosamine moieties. It's basically, you get it from insect cells, things like lobsters and, and prawns and things like that. So this is uh, what happened when we add 50 milligrams per liter of chitosan. Uh, you get these sort of flocculants forming over here on the right. And then after 24 hours of allowing the flocculation to occur, we found that the vast majority of the cultures are sedimented to the bottom. This is fantastic. We had about 98% of uh, the culture uh, going to the bottom over here compared to the reduction of absorbance in there compared to there. What we did find was this uh, process was incredibly pH dependent. So luckily when we did this with our first cultures, the cultures were about pH seven or so. And at that particular uh, range, the flocculation efficiency was 99%. When we did our second growth experiment, the pH was slightly higher and we found that the flocculation wasn't working that well. But what we did was we used CO2 bubbling to artificially lower the pH to roughly about seven again. And this worked really, really well to encourage the flocculation to occur. So if you do find your pH range changes a bit, then there are options to get it within the range required for flocculation to work. So if you are working at scale and you want to try flocculation with Chaisen, I would highly recommend it. It seemed to work quite well with, with Seneca sisters. We then went to our, our local extraction facility. This is Harriet Watson at the University nearby to Edinburgh. They have some nice high pressure homogenization facilities and various higher scale extraction apparatus. Here we have Mert who was working on the project using a high pressure homogenizer to break open the Seneca sister cells. I'm not going to go into detail of the various high pressure homogenization protocols we tried out to optimize the system. Basically what we found is that when we, we extracted the cells, we got a lot of phycocyanin out and a lot of, uh, well not a lot, but some chlorophyll contamination as well, which isn't completely unexpected. Once we had our, our slurry extracted from our high pressure homogenization, we then went about developing a, an ammonium sulfate heat, heat treatment process to try to purify that uh, sample a little bit further. So what we, we know because the phycocyanin is, is thermotolerant, we can use heat treatment without uh, disturbing it, well, without denaturing it, but we, that would actually denature the native proteins in our Seneca sisters extract. So what we did here is in two different orders. We either applied a heat treatment first, and then we did a 15% ammonium sulfate precipitation. With this, we reduced the chlorophyll content a little bit and we improved our, our purities. But when we did it the other way around, where we did our 15% ammonium sulfate precipitation, we found that we got we lost a little bit of phycocyanin, but it stayed roughly the same, not statistically different. But then when we did the heat treatment afterwards, that pulled out the vast majority of chlorophyll contamination over here and then improved our purity as well. The native alophycocyanin was also reduced, as you'd expect from a heat treatment, because it would denature under higher temperatures. And so with that, we ended up with a PC purity of roughly about three. So this is just below research grade. Uh, we ended up with about, I think, eight to 10 grams of it from all those cultures. And the mean TCC, PCD recovery from our initial culture was about 84%, which is relatively decent. We only lost about 20% or so during this extraction process. So we've now got this phycocyanin in, in the lab. It's really nice to have something tangible from these uh, cultures. And we've been uh, working with Scott Bio, our industrial partner, as well as various other small to medium enterprises like Nost Algae, who are basically textile. They like using natural dyes to, to dye textiles, and they want to test how well the thermotolerant phycocyanin works with their materials. Uh, Anton has linked up with this really nifty company called Hemp Eyewear, which is an Edinburgh-based company. And they want to use natural dyes to dye uh, basically the frames of the sunglass that they, they produce using hemp with different natural pigments, you can see saffrons, red berry, and our uh, phycocyanin over there. So yeah, that's basically all I want to say about that. We had a recent press release over here, if you want to have a look at that. 
And with that, I'd just like to thank all of the people we've collaborated with over the years in terms of building CyanoGate, the current ongoing collaborations, things that we're doing with CyanoGate, like the CyanoSource Library, and everyone in our lab, which has been working on this project, particularly Anton, for the work he's done today. And then last but not least, Scott Bio, who's been a really wonderful company to collaborate with over the last few years. With that, I think I'll, I'll close and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions.